السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أما بعد فوض بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام صدق الله العظيم My dear respected elders and brothers we begin by praising Almighty Allah sending salutations upon our beloved Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. An important part of our religion, it is the right of fellow human beings. How do we interact with people across the board? How do we interact with our family members, with our relatives, with our wives, with our neighbors, with people in our society and community and across the faith spectrum? And this is known as Hukuq al And in English, we will term, term it as the rights of fellow human beings. In other words, human rights. However, when we talk about human rights, we think about the political concept of human rights. And human rights in that sense has become a guise for cultural crusade and imperialism. It is the system that has created an unjust global system, allowing those who are more powerful to invade lands, and marginalize morality, religion, and justice with maximum impunity and minimum accountability. This is, however, a completely different subject. What I'm talking today about is the rights that we owe to one another. What an important part of our religion this is. In a hadith in Sunan al-Bayhaqi, Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala said, there are three types of deeds. One deed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive. By his own declaration. Inna Allah la yaghfiru ay yushraka bih wa yaghfiru ma'duna thalika lima yasha. Allah will not forgive a person who associate partners to Allah. That is a cardinal sin. A person who dies while associating partners to Allah, then Allah will not forgive that sin. One is a sin that is violating the laws of Allah. That is up to Allah Ta'ala whether he wants to forgive or not. Wa yaghfiru ma'duna thalika lima yasha. And the third type of deed is a deed that is between you and a fellow human being. And that Allah Ta'ala has decreed that Allah won't forgive until the person whom you have wronged, he does not forgive you. Then therefore, ulama have said from these three types of deed, sometimes the rights of fellow human beings is even more severe and more important than the rights of Allah. The reason is Allah is Ghafoorul Rahim. Allah is very forgiving, very merciful, very compassionate. And if you violate the laws of Allah and you are sincere in your repentance, Allah Ta'ala most likely will forgive you. But human being is not so forgiving. If you do wrong to a human being, he might not forgive you when you need it most. And Allah has decreed Allah won't forgive you until the human being himself forgives you. So in that way, some ulama have said that it assumes even greater importance than The, the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the important things with regard to Islam, whenever Islam tells us about something, whenever Islam commands us to about something, it always gives us principles how to achieve that which it has commanded. In a similar manner, when it prohibits some things, it tells us how to stay away from it. A big example, Allah ta'ala has prohibited zina. and adultery, and fornication. But Allah Ta'ala has also in the same way prohibited all areas which lead to zina and adultery. Therefore, you know, seeing a woman with lust, touching a woman, being alone with her in privacy, all of these things have been prohibited. Why? The principle of Islam is when it prohibits something, it prohibits all avenues leading to that prohibition. In a similar manner, when Allah Ta'ala gives us a command, it also tells us about how we are supposed to achieve that command. So when Allah Ta'ala tells us about human rights, fulfilling the rights of other people, then it also tells us how to fulfill that rights. And I will just give you three or four principles about what Allah Ta'ala has made mention with regard to this. Human rights, the rights of fellow human beings, is part of deen and it is part of piety. Sometimes we tend to forget this. We make this distinction between a good human being because he is good to human beings and a pious person because he makes ibadat. So we make this distinction. 
And I don't know where we get this distinction. So a pious person is he who reads Salat properly, but a good person is he who is good with other human beings. Although Nabi Karim Sallallahu had said, إِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنَ لِيُدْرِكَ بِحُسْنِ خُلْقِهِ دَرَجَةَ قَائِمِ اللَّيْلِ وَسَائِمِ النَّهَارِ A mu'min through the means of good conduct gets the same reward of a one who makes tahajjud all night. And he makes nafil no rosas all the days in which he is supposed to keep. So raful, the rights of human beings is part and parcel of deen and part and parcel of piety. One of our great scholars in the past, Dr. Abdullah, Rahmatullah who was a khalifa of Mu'atami, Rahmatullah one day came to his ustad and his spiritual mentor to tell him that the desired quality of Ihsan, which Nabi Karim Sallallahu was asked about in Hadith of Jibreel, Mal Ihsan, what is Ihsan? أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَى فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاك You worship Allah Ta'ala as if you are seeing Allah. If you can't do that, at least think that Allah Ta'ala is seeing you. So he said, Alhamdulillah, I got that desired state in my salat, expecting the ustad to compliment him. The ustad said, only in salat? Now bring that quality that you are seeing Allah, otherwise Allah is seeing you in every relationship and every walk of life. How you deal with your wife, how you deal with your neighbors, how you deal with your relatives, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take account with regard to it. One of our great scholars who wrote a commentary on the famous book of Hadith, Mawlana Shabbir Ahmed Usmani. He was the one who was the first person to raise the Pakistani flag at the time of independence. And of course that time, ulama supported the concept that it will become a haven and it will become a means of Islamic rule in that land. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out that way. He has written in this commentary, and I want you to listen to this, what he has written. A person who severs family relationship, does not assist and help his relatives, causes difficulty to neighbors, searches faults in other people, talks and behaves arrogantly, will not enter Jannah, even if his Salat and Zikr are abundant. He will not enter Jannah because he has not fulfilled an important part of Islam. The second thing with regard to this, you know, rights of human being is Allah will take account of violation of human rights. That we don't fulfill the rights of one another just as he will take account of the violation of his own right. This has been beautifully encapsulated in one, you know, saying in one incident. There was a very famous Persian ruler. So when he conquered a place in Persia, he was pious, but of course the army were not so pious. So they came to an old woman. She only had one means of income, which was her, her cow. They slaughtered it. They ate the meat. And for them it was nothing. But for her it was a means of income. So she was very disappointed. Someone told her that the king is a very just ruler. He is a just king. Go and complain to him what his army had done. And he is crossing this bridge tomorrow. Go and wait at that bridge and go and speak to him about it. And she went to that bridge and when the king came, she told him an amazing thing. She said, either you sort me out and you restore my rights on this bridge or otherwise I will catch you on that bridge. Meaning, pul sirat. Either you sort me out now Otherwise, I will take account for you when you need it most. Then it will be very difficult for you to be able to escape. So violation of human rights, Allah Ta'ala will take account of it. Thirdly, in our deen, there is greater emphasis on the fulfillment of obligation rather than the receiving of your rights. I don't know how many times to make. Allah Ta'ala in the Quran has made mention of this. You know, there were two sons of Adam alayhi salam. One killed the other son. The famous incident of Habil and Qabil, Cain and Abel. So one of them killed the other one. And when he was about to kill him, the one who was oppressed said, if you lift your hand to kill me, ma'ana biba siti yadiya ilayka li I will not do the same. Because remember one thing, Allah will not question you on the day of judgment why you are oppressed. Allah will not question you on the day of Qiyamah why your rights were not being fulfilled. But the person who did not fulfill your rights and the person who oppressed you, he will have to account. So the third important principle with regard to fellow human beings and fulfilling the rights of human beings is, you know, worry more about the fulfillment of your obligation 
rather than receiving of your, your dues and your rights. Fourthly, this human rights is an amanat. And Allah Ta'ala tells us, Inna Allah ya'murukum an tuadul amanat. Allah Ta'ala commands you to fulfill amanat and trust. And fulfill the rights of a fellow human being is amanat. Every aspect with regard to fulfillment of the rights of others is an amanat. It reminds me of a statement of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who one day said that, that لو مات جمل على شط الفرات If an, a camel dies of hunger on the back of Euphrates while I'm in Medina, I'm afraid that that is an obligation and a trust about which Allah will question me on the day of Qiyamah. Even if an animal dies under my watch, I'm afraid Allah will question me. Today, look at the rulers of the world. There are people who are dying of poverty under their weight and under their rule and under their watch and it matters nothing to them. Fulfillment of the rights of human beings is an amanat. It's an obligation. It is a trust. And lastly, whenever Allah Ta'ala makes mention with regard to the rights of human beings, Allah Ta'ala qualifies it with taqwa. Fearing Allah. Allah Fear Allah with regard to the rights of your relatives. Why does Allah Ta'ala qualify it with Allah Ta'ala's fear? The greater the fear of Allah, the greater you will see the need to fulfill the rights of other human beings. And another important point, you know, I always tell people at the time of nikah, etc., which is a very important thing, and that is the more you fear Allah, the more you fulfill the rights of Allah Ta'ala, the more greater and the more happy will your relationship with fellow human beings be. Why? Because the hearts of people are in the hands of Allah. If you disobey Allah Ta'ala, what happens? He turns the hearts of people with cruelty towards you. They will not fulfill your rights. One of our great scholars, Sufyan Thawri, used to say, the day I disobey Allah, that time they used to have camels for their conveyance. The day I disobey Allah, I see the impact upon it on my camel. My camel also doesn't want to follow me. He doesn't follow my instruction. Why is it so? Because you have not follow, followed the creator of the camel. So if you are not going to follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how do you expect human beings who have been created by Allah ta'ala to turn towards you with mercy and your, your relationship will be better? So these are five principles I have given you with regard to human rights. Now one important point why I have started off this topic today is that in our country, there is the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. It is a campaign which the government has undertaken because of the high rate and prevalence of gender-based and violence against children. How many times people will say, why do we need to follow the government or follow, follow any other you know, entity with regard to choosing a topic? But one of the reasons is that when there is an activism and when there is a promotion in the media, in social media, about a situation, about any activity, about any activism, then of course there is much made about it in the media. So the reason why we make mention with regard to it, not that it is an obligation, but the reason is when everyone is talking about it, there is activism with regard to it, there is media statements with regard to it, we must know our religious obligation and our religious views with regard to that matter. Let me very briefly make mention with regard to some of the stats without going into much detail. According to a 2022 national survey, something like 23% of women in South Africa have experienced physical violence from their partners. Approximately 33% of girls, one third, have experienced some form of sexual violence before the age of 18. Statistic reveals that a woman is raped every three hours in South Africa. The femicide rate in South Africa, the killing of women in South Africa, is 10.6 per 100,000 women, which is five times higher than the global average. Now many times people will say, well, that is, doesn't impact upon us, we might be completely free from that. Well, are we so free? Is there a situation that we can say with confidence that there is no abuse, emotional, physical, in our marriages and in our relationship? 
maybe perhaps we will be quite surprised with regard to it. So this is something that because it is something that is happening, there is an activism we need to be aware with regard to it. Domestic violence exists in both Muslim and non-Muslim society. The position of Islam on the kind treatment of women is very clear as mentioned in the Holy Quran and exemplified through the noble example of none other than the best of example which Allah Ta'ala says Verily in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we have a perfect example. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's perfect example is not only about zikr, is not only about salat, it is about even with regard to domestic life and every aspect of life. I'll just give you a few examples from the marital life of our beloved Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, this is a perfect example. Let me first of start off by saying that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never ever lifted his hand. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never ever lifted his hand on any woman, on any children. Never in the life of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is there a record of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lifting his hand with, or to his woman, to his wife or to any children. Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was an example of kindness and compassion personified. And Allah has made mention of it in the Quran. It is a rahmat of Allah that the Prophet of Allah was kind and compassionate towards you. If he was harsh and he was violent and he was vulgar, people would not have surrounded him out of love. My dear respected brothers, this ayat teaches us Kindness brings people together. Harshness and vulgarity turns families upside down. And it turns families away from one another. Deal with people, our beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us with the wives according to their temperament. Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had many wives. And I'm not saying everyone must have it, you know. And no, it's not something that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had. And of course, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to fulfill the rights of everyone. I'll give you one example. When he got married to Ummi Salma radiallahu ta'ala, she said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm prepared to marry to you. It's an honor, but I'm worried. And amongst the worries she made mention was, I am sensitive. I do not know how I will deal with my co-wives. And Nabi Akarim Sawasam said, don't worry. I will deal with your sensitivity. And not once thereafter do we get any type of complaint with regard to her complaining about her sensitivity. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew she was sensitive. He dealt with her sensitivity. Amongst the wives of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala was young and enthusiastic. Hazrat Khadija radiallahu ta'ala was, you know, wise and matured. You know, Hazrat Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala was the daughter of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala. She had some of that characteristics. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dealt with every wife according to their temperament. Deal with your wives according to their temperament. Take into account their temperament and deal with them accordingly. Protect your wives from taunts. Hazrat Safiya radiallahu ta'ala one day came to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She was from Jewish background and she came into the nikah of Nabi Akarim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, the other wives of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are taunting me. That because I am not an Arab, you do not love me as much as you love them. Nabi Akarim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Next time they taunt you, Tell them, don't taunt me. My husband is a Nabi of Allah. My husband is Muhammadur Rasulullah. And my great grandfather is Hazrat Musa and Hazrat Harun. Hazrat Musa and Harun. Huh? And they are also prophets of Almighty Allah. You don't have the lineage which I have. If ever you bring a woman and ever you bring a wife who is from a different type of background from your family, then you stand up for your wife. The way Nabi Karim Sallallahu stood up for his wife when she faced taunt. This is the way of Nabi Karim Sallallahu Support amongst, amongst anxiety. The husband and wife are supposed to le lead a life where the first port of call for both of them, whenever there is a difficulty, whenever there is a challenge, they come to come and get consolation and sympathy from one another. When Nabi Karim Sallallahu received the first wahi, Dizzy and frightened by the strange experience, where did he go to? He didn't go to his friends. He went to his wife. He went to Khadija radiallahu ta'ala. 
and said, Zambiluni, Zambiluni. Oh, Khadija, cover me, cover me. Inni khashitu ala nafsi. I'm afraid with regard to my nafs and my life, with regard to the responsibility that has been bestowed upon me. What did she do? Today I always tell people that I'm... Someone parked badly, Range Rover KY98. There's someone who was parked badly, what, what, what Range Rover? Yeah, KY98. KY98, if they can please remove it and not cause inconvenience. Jazakumullah. So where, where did Nabi Wasallam go when he got his first wahi? He came to Khadija radiallahu ta'ala. Sometimes I say today in our situation, I make this joke many a times that a Muslim wife spends half her life looking for her husband and the other half wondering where he is. Nabi Karim Wasallam came first to his wife and she also gave such beautiful words of support. Oh my, oh my husband, Wallahi la yughzik Allahu abada. Allah will never disgrace you. Innaka la tasilu raham. You are all the time mending relationship. You are all the time taking the part of those who are underprivileged and those who are oppressed. You are all the time with taqri zayf. You are all the time, you know, entertaining guests. You are all the time taking the path of, the, of right, righteousness. I take an oath by the being in whose hands lies, lies the life of Khatija. Whether other people accept in you or not, I bear witness that you are the messenger of Allah. You are the prophet of Allah. The first person to bear witness to the greatest truth created by Allah was a woman. So this was, sometimes you need to understand your wife. Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, used to tell Hazrat Aisha, I know when you are in a very good, with, good mood with me. And sometimes I even know when perhaps there is something that is bothering you with regard to me. Ya Rasulullah, how do you know this? Because when you speak to me, when your, your mood is good and everything is going well, the Arabs used to say a lot of oaths and qasams in their speech. Then in your oath you said, by the Lord of Muhammad. And if there is something that is bothering you, you say, by the Lord of Ibrahim alayhi huh? salam. Subhanallah. Do we understand our spouse? Do we know the moods of our spouse when we come home? Do we know all of these type of things? This is the way our beloved Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa dealt. And this is how we are supposed to take an example. You know, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa had said, the greatest mu'min in terms of iman is the one who has the best character and conduct. And the best amongst you are those who are the best to his woman and to his wives. It can be understood from this hadith that the husband's treatment of his wife reflects a Muslim's good character, which in turn reflects his iman. If he's not good to his wife, he does not have proper iman. That is the sum total of the hadith which I have made mention and I have given an example from our beloved Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa Conflict in marriage is unavoidable, right? And sometimes it happens. Unless one is conscious of Allah Ta'ala, it can lead to a lot of anger. I was recently reading and I will just now conclude with these last few sentences and few words. You know, it is important that we look at you know, one of our great scholars, Mufti Rafi Usmani, who passed away about a year or two back, you know, he makes mention in one of his mawahis, in one of his lectures, that uh, Dr. Abdullah Arafi, whom I quoted earlier, his wife came to visit the household of Mufti Rafi Usmani. Right? And they told her that, why don't you speak to us with regard to your departed husband? How was he in terms of his conduct? How was he in terms of how his relationship with you? How did he relate to you? And he said a sentence. She said a sentence with regard to her husband, which when I hear it, when I heard it, you know, I shuddered. Because I wonder if anyone can reach that state of piety which Dr. Abdullah Sahib Rahmatullah's wife made mention of him. She said, Kabi bi zindagi mein lehje badal kar baat nahi ki. Not once in our marriage did he change his tone and speak to me. Not once in the marriage did he change his tone and speak to me. Not once did he speak to her in anger. That is what comes about because when you fear Allah, how you treat other human beings. So even if there is situations with regard to emotions to manage, the first step would be to forgive. And under no circumstances, even when one is angry or feel justified, is a husband allowed to humiliate or lift his hands towards his wife. This is something 
that is not correct in an Islamic perspective, especially hitting and beating the way it is understood with regard to abuse. Be good to your wives. If you dislike something with regard to your wife, perhaps you don't like one quality of hers. And Allah Ta'ala, وَيَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا And Allah Ta'ala has kept so many other good qualities in her. Perpetuate the good. And with regard to the negative, you overlook the negative. And you gradually bring it to rectification. And you bring it to correctness. Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said in one hadith, اللَّهُمَّ إِنِّي وَحَرِّجُ حَقَّ الْضِعْفَيْنِ O Allah, I make you a witness. And I want you to just listen to this. Oh Allah, I make you a witness huh, that I have issued to my ummah a warning for them that they should fulfill the rights of the two weak ones in our community and in our ummah, the orphans and the women. Oh Allah, I make you a witness that I have told my ummah that they are supposed to look after the vulnerable people in this ummah and amongst those Nabi Karim Sallallahu specifically made mention with regard to the orphans and with regard to the women folk. May Allah Ta'ala have given us a topic of understanding as I made mention in the beginning stages of the talk. I just very briefly made mention that the importance of fulfilling the rights of one another, certain principles with regard to how we are supposed to fulfill the rights of one another, said about the fact that we have 16 days of activism, you know, in the country with regard to gender-based violence, I gave you steps with regard to how tragic the situation is in South Africa. And I'm not saying that it is in our community, but we need to be careful with regard to it. I gave you examples of Nabi Karim Sallallahu marital life, and I gave you examples of how Nabi Karim Sallallahu in Islam has taught us how we are supposed to behave with our family. May Allah give you an ayat of understanding. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.